No, no. I, for for me, it's the world pouring in. I don't think anything good that I've written is just out of my little brain. My name is Ben Charland. You're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is Elizabeth Hay, the Giller Prize winning author of books such as Late Nights on Air, All Things Consoled, and many others. She's a fascinating author, but also has a fascinating life story. And we talk about both of those things. Now, before we get to it, I want to talk about the coronavirus briefly and how this conversation actually connects to that. We recorded this months before it was a global pandemic, although it was at the time a news story coming out of China. Now, what Elizabeth talks about near the beginning of this episode is Anton Chekhov, the Russian writer, and how he was so productive amidst hardship. Now, this is a debate going on right now as the world deals with lockdowns due to the coronavirus, and we may be dealing with this in waves over the coming months and maybe even years. How productive should we be or can we be in our own homes? There are some lessons for that in this conversation, not just from Chekhov, but from Elizabeth herself. Now, as well as that, we talk about Liz's working style, her writing process, the fact that she's working on a novel right now, a continuation of her book, His Whole Life. We talk about how she learned how to write, the decline of book reviews, and the state of Canadian and global literature. We talk about how we're never going to lose our appetite for stories, but we do ask the question, can AI one day write a novel? We talk about the dilemma between inspiration and discipline, and what do you do when you're stuck? Now, again, this is a fascinating conversation. I hope you take the time not just to listen, but to let me know what you think about it. You can go to the website anytime, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes, as well as a way to get in touch with me on social media or by email. And you can find the show notes for this episode. So everything that we reference, you can find it in the webpage for this episode and find out where those things are, what they are, what they mean. Also, if you like this podcast, please give it a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. Finally, keep this conversation going and let me know what on earth you think is going on. Elizabeth, hey, welcome to the program. Thank you. It is such an honor to be sitting here in your kitchen in Ottawa, Ontario, Uh, talking to you about your life, your books, your writing, and the question, of course, what on earth is going on, which we talked about a little bit before we started this conversation. Um, I'm I'm excited to chat with you. I've I've read your work and um, have been inspired by it for some time. Uh, I read Late Nights on Air some years ago, and it now happens that I'm moving to Whitehorse, so there's a parallel in my life, and recently uh, read All Things Consoled which was a powerful book for me because about 10, 11 years ago, I lost my mother. And it was a much more rapid um, deterioration that she went through than, of course, you went through with your parents. Um, But there were a lot of things that registered with me in reading that book. Uh, And a lot of things in your work that I think answer this question, what on earth is going on? But now I get to ask you directly, um, without any crutch of your books in front of you, uh, Liz, what on earth is going on? So I wish I knew, but I, but I will tell you that, that I've been rereading Chekhov just wow. in the last couple of days. And, and I sent an email to my son saying, uh, my son is a literature student at Cornell. And I said, tell me, uh, because I want to read his letters, tell me a good edition of his letters. And Ben said to me, well, there's one on your bookshelf. It's called <laughs> A Life in Letters, um, which I had forgotten I had. So I dug it out, and I started to read these letters. And, and, and well, what is going on with Chekhov is that he died so young. He, and he, he had tuberculosis so, so early on. So he was spitting blood by the age of 20. He was dead in his early 40s. And, and the letters I was reading yesterday were about these long journeys he made um, in the most uncomfortable circumstances and conditions. And, you know, this is Russia. This is Russia in the late 19th century. And people experience such hardship constantly. And yet he keeps this 
amazing sense of humor as he writes, and he is so productive. So he, 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 I don't know where he found his energy. I don't know how he managed to be such a, a, a constant correspondent, fascinating correspondent. But, but here's the thing. I have my life here, as you know, in, in Ottawa, in this great house, and the sunshine is pouring in today, and I am comfortable. I, 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 I'm a very lucky person. I have a very comfortable life. I'm doing what I want to do. And yet when I think about the world, I feel unhinged. So it's this paradox between, that I feel all the time actually, between thinking um, my life is so good and the world is so shitty. And it, it um, discombobulates me actually. I think you've hit upon one of the great ironies of our time. Um, it's something that the comedian Louis C.K. actually commented on a, a, as a joke, but it's quite a serious statement. He said, everything is awesome and no one is happy. Well, I'm happy. Right. But, but here's the thing, and I, it's, the, it's the inverse of what you said. Yes. But, what he's, but the reason that I think yes. the reason partly that when we look around, like I feel happy too. I'm, I feel like I'm leading a good, productive, healthy life. I have a good time when I wake up in the morning. I feel like I've accomplished something when I go to bed at night. I'm happy until I turn my perspective to the world. And I think that's what he was getting at because if everyone was happy, then we wouldn't be living in this crazy time where shitty things are occurring every day. And there seems to be this, this sense of complaint and difficulty and, and problem that is when we look in the newspaper or, or look up um, CBC, what's happening in the world today. And it's depressing. And I think if we focus on that, it, I'm no longer happy. I'm now stuck in a different gear in my life. And all the things that I felt good about are no longer there. And the same is true with social media, which is the, the playing field for most people my age and younger who um, see constantly people who seem to be living a better life, who seem to be happier, mm -hmm. who seem to be more fulfilled, who seem to be traveling more and are more beautiful and whatever. In response to that, it's hard for me not to feel competitive and unhappy and unsatisfied and unfulfilled in my own life. And there's this, this difficult paradox that I think you've hit upon there, that we live... In, in a lot of privilege, and we can, and there's a lot of comfort in that, and yet there's something deeply wrong uh, when we go outside. Yeah. Yes. So, so how do you fold that into your life? How how can I fold into my comfortable life the discomfort in the world and and sort of make something with it, do something with it, th have thoughts about it that are more than just bewildered, and so what on earth is going on is that I don't really know what's going on. And, and besides which, I'm 68. So a lot of what's happening is, is just kind of beyond my intelligence to understand. I'm looking at your wonderful equipment, your recording equipment. I worked in radio in my 20s and 30s. And of course, the equipment was nothing like this. Um, and, uh, so, so there's this sense of... of um, everything being kind of beyond me and yet and yet i have the um energy and the drive still to work and to write um uh, and, and 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 how to do it that's always the question so i'm working on a novel right now and um i won't say much about it except that at the heart of it is a is a character lulu blake and um a not all that successful actor, although she's had the stamina to pursue it all her life, uh, who, who first appeared in an earlier novel called His Whole Life. So it's a continuation of an earlier novel. I'm picking up this character, who I'm very fond of, Lulu. Uh, but what does it amount to that I'm working on? I work on this manuscript, and sometimes I feel excited, especially when I'm working on it. Then I walk away from my desk and I think, but does it really amount to anything? And I don't know. So there's that, so there's discomfort in the world all around me. And then there's my internal discomfort yeah. <laughs> about what I'm working on. 
and 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 uh, at the same time, I'm so grateful that I have the time to work on it. You've talked about self doubt before um, in interviews and also on your website. You talk about how you're, you 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 almost embrace this idea of self-doubt, something that you just described, that when you walk away from it, that you're most comfortable at your desk. Right. You've written before. But when you walk away from your desk, there's this nagging, is this good enough? Is this interesting enough? Uh, another thing you said that was interesting is that um, stories don't necessarily come natural natural to you, whereas images yeah. and, and ideas do. Yes. Um, but it seems like you do handle this discomfort and this comfort with the process of writing. I think that it sounds to me like writing is your way of handling this juxtaposition, um, this difficult balancing act that yeah. we all seem to do. Um, some, of, some people meditate, some people go for a walk, some people do all of those things, and they write as well. And I, it sounds to me like writing is not, not to say that it's just therapy. I don't mean to diminish it in that way, but it's your way of processing the world and, and, and giving something back, perhaps, to it. Well, it, it gives me a way to live my life, and that's a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I had this turning point when I was 15, where I discovered, actually, that, that I could write a kind of poetry. This was because of an English class I was in, and, and an this exercise. This was in England, was it? Was this in this London? Is the, this is in, in, in London, England. We lived there for a year, and it what it did was it, it made me realize I had thoughts um, things in my head I had I wasn't even aware of uh, that were triggered by reading. So so this was an exercise where we read a poem. It was a D. H. Lawrence poem, and then, without warning, the the, the teacher asked us to uh, close the book and pull out our notebooks and write down whatever came into our minds, and it was thrilling. And 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 it's taken me a long time actually to kind of parse it into its different components. So what I, I, what I think happened was, first I didn't have time to become self-conscious. So I wasn't seized up. As, you, as at school you always are when you're faced with an exam question or an essay you have to write. So no time to get nervous or self-conscious. And then the, the, the reading just kind of flowed into me and animated my head so that uh, I was able to write things down. And then that gave me company. So I had this, suddenly I was kind of communing with myself in a way that hadn't happened before and communing with myself on paper. And it gave me this private, uh, um, private secretive, if you like, second life. Wow. That's a beautiful thought. When you when you write now, um, is it the same thing, or has it changed over time? Oh, it it it, it uh, is all over the place when I write now. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, this is why it's good to get up early in the morning when it's still dark, and the and the world is not impinging on you, mm. um, and you can and, and and you are in that kind of private private space of. Uh, communing with yourself. Now, I can't avoid having thoughts such as, will, <laughs> will anybody want to publish this book? If they publish it, will it do well? This book that I'm writing now certainly is not going to win an award. In fact, it probably won't even get reviewed. You know, that, that, that kind of, all that noise which you wish wasn't there is there, and it's there um, even more as you write more books. That's amazing because I would have thought it was the opposite. Because I, I would have thought that that would be, for a lot of beginning writers, something that plagues you and even prevents you from writing. And then over time, you're able to just let go. And and having been published, I, I would find it funny if you wrote a book and no one would review it. I oh, mean, but, 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 but books aren't reviewed much anymore. I mean, this is part of... 2020. This right. is part of this year. This new. This. Uh, you know, it's been the case now, increasingly, for a number of years that that review sections in newspapers are disappearing. Right. So I don't even know, not being on 
out uh, in, in social media. I don't even know how people find out about books anymore. I mean, there's obviously social media, people recommend books to one another. Yeah. There's book lists, there's Canada Reads. There's a whole ecosystem where books are recommended to one another. But if, but I, but if I look back through my archive of uh, clippings, and I go back to, oh, 1993, I guess. Which book came out in 1993? Let's say it was, uh, I'm going to just say it was The Only Snow in Havana, but it might have been... It was the third one, I think. It okay, was, Captivity that, Tales. Right. Yeah. So if I go back, there are reviews in every possible newspaper, in, in Saskatchewan, in Halifax, all over the place, and you know, a thick, a thick folder of reviews for a piddling little book like that. Whereas now, (laughs) uh, uh, even though I'm better known, uh, the reviews have have nearly disappeared. I really want to go back to this, to your process and and how you write, but I I can't help but take this tangent that you just offered. What do you think this means for literary culture today? that book reviews, because you're right, book reviews are few and far between. I think your books do get reviewed. Um, I know that um, your last two or three books were reviewed and, and are on, you're on a book tour when you, when you publish them. Um, or at le- and there are also YouTube videos made about your books and podcasts done about your books. Those are out there, whether they count as reviews or not. But there is a diminished sense that we have a culture where people's job is to review books and disseminate that information to the public. What do you think that means for our literary culture today? It's 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 not it's not the best of times. The best of times I've I've experienced, I think. There was a sort of golden age of excitement about poetry of all things in the 1960s. And Canadian poets were were uh I, I, they they were sort of at the top of their game, and people were interested. People were genuinely interested and excited about about Canadian writing, and I say poetry, but of course all Canadian writing, and and that continued, you know, through the seventies and pr- probably into the eighties. Now, uh, friends of mine who used to be big readers listen to podcasts, and they and they've don't read so much anymore. Now, I I don't worry too much about myself. I just want to be able to read everything I want to read in the next 20 years, uh, as long as I have my wits about me and before I die. So I'm not a big podcast listener. I don't watch TV. I I wait until my kids come home, and then together we'll watch uh, episodes of Succession or The Crown. But my son is a literature student, and he's 31. So what kind of rich um, literary life is possible for him? I don't know. I don't know. Um, people will say that we will never lose our appetite for stories. Um, and, 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 and that's probably true. But quite how it's all going to unfold, I don't know. I really don't. I, I agree that we're not going to lose our appetite for stories, but the question then becomes how do we produce and create these stories? It's pretty easy to imagine a future in which we have robots writing us stories so that we can enjoy them and go about our lives. I, I, that sounds almost ridiculous as a dystopia, but it's actually not that far from possibility. Um, the New York Times, I think it was the New York Times, talked recently about what a what jobs ai will be able to do in the in the coming horizon of the future and obviously there are jobs they can already do whether it's uh booking you a flight online or uh, you know having your alexa in your home which can turn on your lights and stuff like that i don't have one i don't think doesn't sound like you have one i just <laughs> said alexa and i didn't hear anything um but in 10 years an, an ai uh program will be able to write a fairly persuasive essay on what to do with your money investing. And in 30, 40, 50 years, it's very conceivable that AI will be able to write a novel, produce a television show, uh, develop a movie, in terms of the script all the way down until you are actually having actors in a room. All of that can be done by by AI. Because AI learns from what we can do. And if we can do it, 
at one point, an artificial intelligence will be able to do it. Now, the question then becomes for me, well, what is story if it's not something that is naturally, innately human to have to be created? Um, because if we're just consumers of a story, then we're in another another dimension. I mean, we're talking yeah. about just what what am I going to read today? or what? I'm, and the other question, too, is, of course, what format does it take? I think you're right. A lot of people are listening to podcasts and watching television and reading less and less, which to me is a tragedy. But that's a personal tragedy. I don't know necessarily if it's a, 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 a tragedy of our society or our civilization. It's a tragedy for me personally because I love to read, and I hope that in 20 years there will be good books to read. Well, and, and, and actually I think there will be. You know, when, when I was a teenager in high school, in uh, Mitchell, Ontario, the great concern, uh, and this would have been in the you know 1960s. The great concern then was leisure time, that 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 work was going to be automated, and so the hu- great human population would have so much leisure time. And what were we to do with it? Hmm. And in fact, look at us. People are working themselves to death. So so what we imagine is going to happen tends not to happen. And actually, if I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pull this toward my book, All Things Consoled, which was about the, the end of my parents' lives and their death. And one of the things that I discovered in looking after my parents uh, at the end was that, that it's impossible to know not only what's going to happen, but how you're going to react to it until you're in the middle of it. So similarly with politics, it's always um, the unexpected that takes place. And, and, and so if we were, you know, and I, and I think about this in terms of my own writing and the books that I love, it's, it's the writers who, whose imaginations give you the unexpected um, that, that I cherish the most i would also say that the 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 best stories that i've encountered in any form but usually in the written form have been the ones where the ending was both unexpected but also inevitable Mm -hmm. logical it had to be this way yes and once you get to the end you realize there's no other way it could have been but it's still it's a very very surprising conclusion um, and actually, Chekhov, going back to Chekhov, is a great example of that. Um, I studied Chekhov. I worked in the theater and studied theater and worked in it for about 10 years and studied Chekhov as the great storyteller. Right. But didn't even know at the time how many short stories he had written. And the short stories are the ones where he really drilled down to the essence of just the, the a great structure of a story. And they're almost comic. They're almost like comic strips, really. Um, and of course, he was able to grab at the that essence in Russian society of the tragedy and the farcical going hand in hand, being right. the same thing. That the only if you're Russian, the only thing you can do about the tragedy is laugh at it. Yes. Um, but there's this idea that not only is something unexpected, it's also inevitable. It had to be that way. And for me that's it's like going back to the earliest stories, like Oedipus Rex in, in Greek tragedy, that the surprise at the end when he discovers who he is. But of course, that's obviously what happens. When we search for something, we are looking for ourselves. The great lesson in that story and many others. Um, but it's hard to do that. And, it, and sometimes it, can, we, it feels forced when we try to recreate that. Um, and, and in a way, story is maybe in our DNA. It's, a, it's our destiny is to tell and consume story. And, 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 and of course, poetry. So I don't want to emphasize... Um, story at the expense of poetry, which I, 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 I think um, is even more fundamental, or, or possibly is fundamental anyway. But what happened to you as an actor? Why did you give up theater? Well, I wasn't, all, I mean, I still work in the theater a little bit, like as a, I became more of a writer than anything, okay. and, a, and a director as well. Um, I loved acting. I loved being on stage. I loved um, the thrill of having an audience in the palm of your hand and being responsible for their, for their journey, but also understanding that the only way to make their journey happen is to kind of ignore them for a little while, you know, and to, and to, to provide them an experience that is authentic and truthful 
and as real as you can within the safe parameters of the theater. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I mean, I, I went to the UK. I lived in London for about three and a half years and ran a theater company there and worked in the theater and, and had a really great time. I did my master's in playwriting when I was there. And then I kind of took a detour and, um, I don't know if I got tired of it or I just wanted to do other things, but I really wanted to explore the world. So I lived in the rest of Europe for a year and then I lived in Africa for another year after that, traveled across Africa. And then I returned to Canada and got involved in politics. And, you know, when people asked me when I got involved in politics in that world, um, they said, so you come from, from the theater. How yes. does that make sense? And I said, makes well, think about sense. it. They're the same thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Politics and theater, they're the same. They're, they're identical. And in fact, because they were so similar, because politics is really nothing much more than public relations, I, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy doing PR for elected officials. It, it, it's not my thing. Um, and I knew that pretty quickly, and yet I stayed with it for, for a little while, partly because I enjoyed the people I was working with, and I, I had a great experience doing it. Um, but there was still that theme, I guess, for me of... Of, of performance and, and storytelling. But I want, you mentioned poetry, and I want to go back yes. to that really quickly. Is poetry doing something different fundamentally from storytelling? Po- poetry puts your finger right on, directly on the pulse, right? So, so that you're, like the, you uh, vibrate. You vibrate with yeah. it when, 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 the, when, now, this is poetry I respond to. Right. There's lots of poetry I don't respond yeah. to, and, and that leaves me cold. But, but, uh, the the author I've been reading repeatedly, actually, in the last couple of years, is is uh, Thomas Tronstrumer, the Swede who won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, his 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 poetry is both very direct and completely understandable, and yet um, so capacious, and and he has this way of looking at things both. So almost simultaneously, very close up, and from a, a distance. So he has that kind of mole, mole look, you know, the mm-hmm. the close close up, and then an eagle eye, and and he and so what you get in his poetry is this enormous space, as well as um, thought and feeling that that I think is wonderful. I I, I so I he's not a chore to read. Uh, some poets, you you are hard. You know, you 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 feel stupid as you try and sort them out. <laughs> but uh, he's not that way, and so I go I go back to him a lot, and and I think what he does, you know, on on in a, in a page, is uh, just so powerful and satisfying and enough enough. And it, it again, it, it goes back to that experience when I was in in uh, grammar school in England that year and uh, started to write poetry, that it just um, makes me want to write when I read him. Okay. So there's a, there's a place, when you say capacious, you're almost saying that there's a, maybe a place for you to Absolutely. be there with him. Yes. But also the, the whole world is in his right. poetry. Right. It's like... Um... I'm trying to think of the was it Mahler who said that when he writes a symphony he's trying to write a, something about the whole world okay. that the, that a symphony for him contained the entire world all of existence the universe you know that that's you know we can we can imagine a symphony trying to do that that yes. that all encompassing all encompassing great mu- piece of music but it's only about an hour long I mean for Mahler it's maybe close to two hours in some cases eternal sometimes that's right. <laughs> But there's a sense of how do I encapsulate everything? And of course, the everything is in the one thing. The, the general is in the specific mm-hmm. and, and vice versa. Um, and I think there's a, a profound sense, both with symphonies and novels and poetry, of finding a place for me. Uh, where can I fit into this? And that's, for me, how good storytelling or good poetry, good music breathes, because it allows me to breathe with it. Yeah, and so you feel more alive. Yeah. And, and, and aware and, of your own life. And I think when you say it makes me want to write... It's funny because that's very, very true, but sometimes good writing makes me feel like, oh, okay, well, I don't need to, why would I bother? It kind of wakes up something competitive of me. Okay. Yes. So, so <laughs> uh, I, 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 can, I, can, I can read 
an author who's who, who you know just I'll, I'll never be able to write uh, that nearly as well of course I won't but that doesn't bother me it doesn't bother me so so for instance I I, I read uh, disgrace by JM Kutsia the mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a very short novel a fantastic novel I've read it several times and and if if I'm stuck myself on on something I'm working or I just feel completely uh, sluggish and apathetic and without a thought in my head and I and I'll read a page there and it just um it it, it as I say it makes me feel like writing it makes me uh, it wakes up s- not just the thought, but a certain energy, and which has a competitive spirit in it. That's a that's a question I have for you. When you write, it's okay for you to read other people's writing. Oh sure. Because some writers have said that they can't do that. Oh well. That when they write, Too they bad can't for let them. anyone else anyone else in any other voice or rhythm in. They have to kind of isolate themselves. I think. No, no. Yeah. I, for for me, it's the world pouring in. Hmm. It's not. I don't. I don't think. Anything good that I've written is just out of my little brain. Sure, yeah. You're 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 open to influence, and and pick up on on the life around you. And that's a very liberating way to look at it, actually, because if writing becomes something you have to insulate from the rest of the world, even from what's going on in my life personally, that I just do in a dark closet, like it's an escape, right? Um, then it's it's I I just feel like it's disconnected from the threads that make good writing good. I think of the uh, screenwriter Charlie Kaufman, who hasn't done much recently, but who wrote the film uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind adaptation, uh, being John Malkovich, like really interesting, heady, yeah. adventurous storytelling that he was engaging with, and he gave a lecture to I think BAFTA at some point, uh, maybe five years ago, and um, talked about how he had to learn to let his own anxieties in and that if he was having fights with his wife, then that had to be part of the story and that to insulate himself from that was to take away the truth. Well, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I, I, I aspire to that. I don't necessarily know how to do it, but I just love that. Yeah. When you said you're competitive though, what do you mean by that? Like you said that when you read a good book, it makes you competitive. Does, does it, do you mean you actually want to, try to do it as well like a Hemingway sort of thing <laughs> I mean it kind of wakes me up and and it, 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 it that it doesn't just wake up my brain cells but it wakes up the writing desire so I I think uh, a little bit of I, I, you know I, I don't kid myself um, but maybe I kid myself a little and I and I say all right I can do it too. Liz mentioned in this conversation that writers who give you the unexpected are often the best ones. But how do we do that? Now, one answer is actually coming up in this conversation when Liz suggests that novelists have to be stupid. Now, I'll let her explain it a little bit later, and that's all coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. There's, I, I can't remember what Hemingway piece it was. It might have been a movable feast. Right. where he wrote about his time in Paris, where he said, I read this author and I, I beat him. Then I beat this author. <laughs> then I beat this author. And he's no, like, I don't say that. No, I know you're not. And I was, but, but I was, when, you, when you said competitive, I'm like, ooh, is that like what Hemingway was talking about? No, I, I get it now. I get what you, it, it's more yes. of an awakening. It's more of a, of a positive uh, sending out as opposed to a you know, call to the ring or something that Hemingway would have done. Yeah. That's right. It, that's right. A movable feast, by the way, is... is so much fun to read. Oh, isn't it great? Yes. I mean, especially if you've been to Full Paris of gossip. or going to Paris. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's to, to be so alive today, that book, which was written back, I think it was in the 1930s, was it? Probably. Um, to be so alive today about something that is, you know, older yeah. is, is quite wonderful. I wanted to ask you about your process. You write pen and pencil on paper, right? Well, I do a fair bit of that, but I also um, increasingly find that I'm just sitting in front of my computer, tapping away. So, so I, 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 um, I, it, it's, 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 I, I, I keep notebooks. And of course, in my notebooks, it's all writing with a pen. And then I type 
stuff up on my computer and print out the hard copy because I have to have hard copy to work on. And, and besides, I don't trust computers. I, I figure it'll all go up in smoke at some point. Mm -hmm. So I, I have always the printed pages in front of me, but then I'll make changes on the computer. So it's, it's um, and, and for whatever reason, uh, who knows why, in the last uh, couple of months, I've been doing more on the computer that is to say, I'll have I'll have my printed manuscript in front of me. I'm working on a chapter, and uh, and I and I and I make all my changes in pencil in the manuscript, and then I put those changes on the computer, and I keep making changes on the computer, and then I'll go back and with a pencil write in the changes I've made on the computer on the manuscript. Okay. Do you do that? I, I'm, I do a mixture. I really enjoy writing with pen or pencil on paper yeah. as an escape from the computer, as an escape from technology. It almost feels like I have to get away from it. It's so yes. uh, commandeering of life in 2020 that I need to get away from it and, and be with myself in a different place. Um, which also means I think being away from, not just away, like my phone and computer is on the other side of the room. I mean, it's on the other side of the city. On the other, some, somewhere where I can't get to it right away. And there have been studies that have been done on this, which show that the closer you are in actual physical proximity to an addictive device like a telephone, like an iPhone or a computer, uh, the more distracted you are. The more energy you have to spend mm -hmm. on not thinking about that, on refusing to touch it. My phone is sitting right over here. I have to spend energy not grabbing it, not checking my email, not checking my text messages. And they've done studies that have shown that students in a room, if their phone is in front of them but turned over so they can't look at it, they perform less well than students whose phone is outside the room. And they perform less well than students whose phone was left at home. Because you have to expend energy on keeping those addictions or sure. those processes at bay. Um, but I just really enjoy the, the feeling of pen on paper. And I feel like I don't, I'm not a doodler. I never was a doodler. But I feel like the potential to doodle, the potential for my pen to go anywhere on the page, to write big, huge letters or really, really small, gives me a certain freedom that I can't get if I'm in a word processor. Now, I know that there are people in the world who <laughs> are very good at word processors and can do all of those things at the, without thinking about it. I'm not one of them. I can be more creative on, 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 a, on a page, but I'm much slower writing when I'm on pen and paper. On Yes. Yeah, much slower, which is a good thing and a bad thing, depending on the circumstance, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the place where we want to be when we're writing is a kind of self-forgetful, undistracted by oneself flow, which, which doesn't happen all that often, really. But if, if, if I'm... Duck. If 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 I'm just endlessly reworking something and kind of spinning my wheels, then whatever method I'm using, um, I need to take a break from. So sometimes that'll be the computer, or if I'm working on the computer, it will be pen and paper, and 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 it doesn't have to be. It can just be. Uh, the back of an envelope, you know. Mm. Suddenly you have a thought, and, and before you know it, you're writing away. Uh, and and then you have to painstakingly gather your scraps of paper and put them all together. There's that classic um, dilemma for the writer between discipline and inspiration. Um, a lot of writers say that, um, you know, inspiration. everyone thinks it's about inspiration, but in fact, inspiration may rarely come. The only people who actually get it done are the ones that show up every day and just go through it. And if they have to spin their wheels, then so be it. They're going to spin their wheels, but eventually they're going to produce a novel. There's an interesting quote, actually. Someone said that writing a novel is like filling up an air balloon with a, with a bike pump. <laughs> right that that if you like you know a whole day spent on your bike pump is not going to take you very far but if you don't do it every day for 2 years you're never going to fill the air balloon yes you know yeah i i took comfort once from some writing teacher what he wasn't a writing teacher he'd written a book about writing and i can't remember who it was but he he floated the thought that in fact novelists have to be stupid and and he meant by that 
that we're slow. Our th- um, now, Margaret Atwood is not, <laughs> but but lots of us are. We're we're we're, we're um, uh, yes, we're we're writing a novel by by and, and we're using um, a bicycle pump to fill a big, which is a little stupid, right? But you have to give yourself the time. But why is that? Is that stupid? Because. Well, it almost <laughs> feels like, why am I doing this? Or well, well, I'm not fast on my feet, and I'm not fast with my pen or with my computer either, and I'm figuring it out as I go along. So, so if you're figuring it out as you go along, if you don't have some grand plan, um, as you might if you were writing a a biography that you could flesh out in point form ahead of time. But rather, you're writing a novel, and you're and you're groping and in the dark most of the time. Yeah. Then it 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 you do feel stupid. I think though the other side of that coin is that there's when it's all said and done, there's room for the reader to come in. Not to say that write a write a shitty novel and therefore will enjoy it more because there's room for me to what improve it or something. I'm actually talking more about like Kafka. Like um, one of the great influences on me when I was in my 20s was reading Franz Kafka because it's not always very good. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to, t- to <laughs> take a dump on one of the great writers of right, the right. 20th century, but there are times when you're thinking like, come on, this isn't, how long is this going to go on for? Yes. Like, does he get to the end? And no, he actually never finished it. So no, he doesn't get to the end of it. Um, and there's a lot of his short stories that were never published and never finished, and his novels were left unfinished. We don't yes. know where he was actually going to go with it, and if he had edited it, what he would have done differently. But that's exactly what makes it so compelling, is that there's room for me to ask those questions. And when I read Kafka, it's maybe the opposite sense of competition that you were talking about, as I go, oh, man, I could do this. <laughs> I, could, I could have a crazy, wa- wacky dream and write about it. And of course, that's not, that's not true. There was a magnificence to that man and a yes. mystery to his mind and a way that he could create these, not just these stories, but these worlds that were not only fantastic, but very um, uh, explicit or implicit about what they were saying about the world around us. Yeah. Um, that takes a lot of skill and talent. But there's something about his work that lets me in. Well, this is what my mother was talking about, my mother who, who was a painter. Mm-hmm. And we were together at some art gallery in New York and uh, and she said we were looking at a painting by a you know famous painter famous enough to have his art in the museum of modern art and and um, and my mother said look and she pointed to a corner of the painting and said he changed his mind mm. i said how do you know he changed his mind and she just said smiled and said i'm looking for the struggle and it, that let her in you know this struggling painter, seeing another artist struggle, it 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 it, it relaxed her, and and allowed her to be more creative. Uh, I remember I, I visited a um, it was a veterans hospital, uh, and there was a room in this in this hospital. It wasn't just veterans who were there, but it was veterans and their spouses or other people, and there was a there was an art. I don't know if it was a class or just a bunch of people who were getting it together to paint and make art. And there were so many different levels in that room. There was someone who was probably just starting out and just learning to like draw a couple of straight lines on a paper. And there was a woman in there who'd clearly been painting for a long time and was painting just beautiful, outrageous art. And she looked like she was maybe 90 uh, and still creating some really wonderful stuff. But the impression that I got from her that was most inspiring was not the work that she was creating. It wasn't what was on the canvas. It was the feeling that she went in there every day and just had a blast. Wasn't really enjoying the other people in the room, didn't care that I was coming through, yes. didn't care about the music that was playing. She was just enjoying her time, making these little decisions one after another on this canvas. And I thought, oh, there's happiness in a way. Yes. There's a sense of fulfillment. And it doesn't even matter what happens to that canvas. There was a sense that she was, a, you know, building something, like, like a kid playing with blocks, slowly but surely making something that, it doesn't matter if it was reflection on her or not. It was just interesting for her. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that that image of her sitting there painting stuck with me. And I don't know why. I mean, people do that every day. But there was something about the context and about her and her 
focus that was impressionable. And, 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 and as you say, she wasn't worried. She wasn't worried about, about um, selling that painting. This, 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 is, this is what I am, am always trying to remind myself, that, that it's the being fully alive. That's what we're after here. And in my case, it's um, I, uh, writing is what helps me feel fully alive. Not not when it's going badly, of course, but there you are. And yet, you're still preoccupied by some of these questions, like, will this be published? Will this be? Oh reviewed? well, how can how, you know? That's the 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 noise, the industry noise, right? That that you want to turn off. Yeah. And yet, it it it. Is, I can sort of turn the volume down at times, but right. it's, it's it's there. It's a static. It's a noise, and. I was talking with a playwright friend of mine actually about this and said, you know, what a what a stupid thing to have this noise in my head. Um, and she disagreed. She said, look, uh, of course you want your your work to to reach an audience. You know, you want it to be out there. You want it to be talked about. There's nothing wrong with that. She as a playwright felt exactly the same thing and she was out there. Um, you know, so, 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 so I thought, well, that's right too. That's right too. It's not, I don't have to just tamp it down and try and shut it off altogether since I'm incapable of doing that, but rather see it in a different way that, okay, so there you are. You, you, you want your book to do well. Yeah. So be it. That's your, that's yeah. your condition. That's your, it's almost, there's almost a, uh, relationship here to uh, Buddhism and, and meditation in the sense that the all of this the the storm of emotions and, and feelings and thoughts that all of us have every day and this sense that of impending death that one day I won't be here anymore um, all of this noise you can't shut it off yes that's true it's impossible that's that's what it means to be human you can maybe turn the volume down or and or Learn to just accept it and live with it and accept the noise for what it is and find your flow in that and find a way to, to work with that because to deny it takes more energy. It's almost like the same thing we were talking about earlier about pretend, denying my phone, denying the technology and spending effort and mental energy on not accessing that as opposed to um, I'm just going to accept what it is and accept that that is who I am and be liberated by that. But that sounds really challenging because there's value in all of this. There's a there's a sense there's a voice that's saying, you know, write the story you want to write, and to hell with everybody else, mm -hmm. and to hell with the publisher and reviewers. Just be who you are and be what you want to be. But the the trick I think for me would be is that, well, who I am are these voices? Is these voices that I'm hearing, and is this this pressure? Yes. Yeah. And 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 once you once you uh, stop trying to shut it down then there's not just room for that but room for much else as well so you're you're yes i agree this the buddhists are right <laughs> <laughs> but it's not easy though when you're struggling with because you know we talked about struggle when you're struggling with writing or struggling with you know whether it's the editing process or the creating process are there things that you turn to regularly or is it always different in other words do you do you always mop the floor when, when you're distracted or do you turn on the TV or radio or are there set things that you usually do that you fall back on or does it depend on the story that you're telling? You mean when, I, when I'm stuck, do yeah. I, what do I do? Yeah. Well, when I'm stuck, I read. So uh, I'll read someone I admire. I, I, I think I'm repeating myself here when I say that it, it then um, both distracts me from myself and gets me out of a rut. This is something I learned in radio, actually, from a, a radio producer years ago. I was working on a, on a documentary. This is for the program Sunday morning at the time. And I, I had worked myself into a knot of uh, anxiety and blockage. And she just said to me, you know, when, I, when, when that happens to me, I'll just pick up a magazine and read for a little bit. And it so I did. This wasn't great art I was reading. It was mm. some article, but it, it just took my mind off my anxiety enough 
that that my thought started to flow again and I could write and finish the documentary. So that that's my uh, approach to being blocked, is to read. Do you find going for a walk or being in any way physical can be helpful? Yes, too? absolutely. Absolutely. Movement. So... So it's not as if I go for a walk and my, and my brain is suddenly teeming with thoughts, but sometimes thoughts do occur when I walk, just out of nowhere. Yeah. And, that, and that's because you've, you've set yourself in motion. And, and also, you know, so you're sitting at your desk and uh, everything's kind of ground to a halt. Yes, if you get up and move around, come downstairs then some thought passes through your mind and and it starts up again the 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 uh the uh whatever you were trying to write has gets a fresh breath when we i mean some of the one of the threads of this conversation so far i think is this idea of the the, the mystery of of writing the unknown delving into uncertainty on a daily basis is that frustrate you more or enchant you more in the not knowing the not knowing does it frustrate me more than it than it enchants me well you talked about buddhism and i do actually um meditate every morning it's not rigorously buddhist it's it's uh. or anything but i have my little meditation stool that my husband made for me um and it's uh, a lovely thing just to uh do first thing in the morning. So that's all about not knowing and 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 not thinking you have to know. But I, I'm also my father's daughter, who was he was a very competitive man and very dissatisfied with himself. Mm. So he would kind of grind his his bones uh and his dissatisfaction against each other and and um so it's all over the place. It's all over the place, but 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 I, I at least I can come back to certain truths, remind myself of certain truths, and that is that that um, we don't know and we can't know, and 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 in not knowing, there's a lot of space that opens up. I have to say that in reading All Things Consoled, um, your description—well, not just description—you're telling the story of your father was one of the most compelling aspects of that novel of that memoir that frustration was was um palpable his disappointment um at that age was hard to read but it, but extremely compelling for the same reason and and i think very common among older people but especially among older men men who've who who who've had rewarding careers and then find themselves with nothing much to do and they feel useless mm. And it's lousy. Yeah, there was there was something really powerful about that. As and as a young man, how do you avoid that? How do you? How do I live a life where I don't become so, um, you know, um, not just dissatisfied, but um, lost? There's a sense of lost or a sense of, uh, yeah. What do I do? Like you just said. Well, it helps if you have a sense of humor. Did he have a sense of he humor? He had a sense of humor, but not really about himself. Right. So he never really learned how to relax about himself. And and, and, and I think about this a lot. Had, had my dad only learned how to relax um, and just... Well, my husband was saying this about his own father, that he wished he had told his father, who was another very competitive man, you know, you accomplished a lot. Rest easy. You accomplished a lot, but these these competitive men yeah. want to accomplish more. You know, they don't want to stop accomplishing. Totally. When I, when when you just said that, I imagined myself being that person you were saying it to, and, and just, uh, my thought was, no, I have not accomplished anything. Yeah. Well, um, this is the thing, and, isn't and, it? And don't tell me that I've accomplished anything. That don't don't try to placate me. Don't try to sit me down. Don't try to put me at rest. I am not happy with this. <laughs> yeah, we could totally spend another hour talking about theater. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much for oh, this. Thank this you, has Ben. Been great. Yeah, thank you so much. I don't know if someone congratulates me on a job well done. I rarely will accept it. 
I will be graceful in it, or, or gracious, I guess, and pretend that it's all good, but I, I can't stand hearing it because I think it's false. And I think that if I believe it, it'll send me down a dark path. And I think that it's not that I take myself too seriously, or maybe I do, I don't know. But there's, there's, a, rela- there's a relation there between that feeling and your dad's feeling yes. of disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, a Beryl Bainbridge novel. I, mean, I, I, I love Beryl Bain, Bainbridge. Hard though her name is to say. <laughs> uh, the English writer who died, uh, I don't know, a dozen years ago or so. Um, and it might be The Birthday Boys, which was her novel about Scott and his um, attempt to reach the, the South Pole. But there are the, it's about these men who, who are ab- absolutely heroic, really, in, in, in what they're d- attempting to do and what they've done. And, and, I, and, and, and I think she has one of them at the end of his life sort of lying there with his eyes closed thinking, I've wasted my life. And I do th- hope, but I suspect it will happen to me too, that it probably happens to all of us. At the end, we lie there thinking, I did so little. If only I'd done more. What was the matter with me? Why did I do so little? I've wasted my life. Hmm. But, but we don't have to be that way. I mean, we can, we can uh, joke instead. Yeah, I think maybe what you're saying is that it's almost inevitable to, to think that, no matter what we've done before. It's not a matter of quantity or quality of our lives. It's a matter of that's the state that we're in. That's the emotion that we're going to have. In the same way that when you're when you're writing or when you're painting, there's an essence of struggle mm-hmm. that's inevitable. That is, that it's unavoidable. It's going to be that way. So why pretend that you can achieve something differently? You're going to feel disappointed. So why not just laugh about it? Why not? be like Chekhov and have a good laugh at the tragedy that you're facing and turn it into a bit of a farce. If there was one thing that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, and if we had another hour to dig into it uh, and ask what on earth is going on with something, what would that something be? Well, I probably would have asked you more about theater since since uh, uh, my daughter is a struggling actor. Oh, okay. Yeah. But where, where is, where no, is so, that? So she's based in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And and if if it's hard to be a writer... It's probably harder to be an actor. Yeah, we could totally spend another hour talking about theater. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much for oh, this. Thank this you, has ben. been great. Yeah, thank you so much. To learn more about Elizabeth Hay, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes as well as a way to get in touch with me. Let me know what you think of this episode. Let me know what you think of this podcast. And you can get the show notes for this episode. So if there's anything that was mentioned that you're not sure what it was or you can't remember the name of it, it's all there on the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. I'd also appreciate it if you like this podcast, give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast provider that you use. You can even do that on Facebook. Now, your quote of the week is from Anton Chekhov, who was mentioned at the beginning of this episode, and he says, You are confusing two notions, the solution of a problem and the correct posing of the question. Only the second is essential for the artist. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein, for this wonderful music, and special thanks to Liz Hay for letting us record this episode in the comfort of her home in Ottawa, Ontario. Next up on this podcast, we're talking with another novelist, Andrew Piper of Toronto. He's the author of The Demonologist and most recently, The Residence. I'll see you then. Mm-hmm.